Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to JLF, uh, first of all, for making this happen. And welcome, everyone. Uh, we're going to talk today about the mystery of the Parsi lawyer, uh, an early 20th century mystery, only that it's uh, not fiction. <laughs> and uh, first, my first question to you, Shrabni, is who is the Parsi lawyer, and what is this mystery about? Absolutely. Well, lovely to be here. Thank you for all coming after lunch when you should be sleeping, uh, but we will wake you up. <laughs> and uh, yes, so who is the Parsi lawyer? His name is George Edalji. He is a 28-year-old lawyer, and he works in Birmingham, uh, lives in a small village called Great Worley, a few miles from Birmingham. And his father, interestingly, is the vicar of uh, Great Worley. So that is the background to this, to this book. And um, the father, I'm going to start briefly with the father, because he, his name is Shapurji Adalji, and he left Bombay. He was a Parsi. He converted, even as a teenager, became a Christian, um, went, always wanted to go to England and become a, you know, study curacy. So he goes to England, he studies, and 10 years later, he marries an English woman. 10 years later, he's the vicar, the first South Asian vicar of this little village called Great Worley. And of course, this is 1876. This is the height of empire. Queen Victoria has just been declared Empress of India. And here we have a brown man with a very strong Indian accent preaching the word of God to a white parish. It's a recipe for disaster. <laughs> so that's where we start. Um, immediately, they start getting race hate letters, anonymous letters, graffiti, the works. And this goes on over several years. So to cut a long story short, uh, George, even from the time when he's 12 years old, uh, starts receiving this hate mail. And then time moves on. He, is, he goes to school, he goes to university, he's a lawyer. And suddenly, things take a turn, a nasty turn, in 1903. This is the turn of the century. This little village of Great Worley is going to be the scene of a real ghastly crime. So somebody is coming in the dead of night and slashing horses, mutilating cattle, and leaving them to die in the fields. It's absolutely gruesome. The police are called, bloodhounds are got on. They can't do anything. They cannot find this killer. And everyone is, you know, the village is anxious. The press are there. It's a huge story. They call him the Whirly Ripper. He comes in the middle of the night, and he does this, and he disappears. And of course, what's going to happen when you have a village, a small village, tiny community, it's got to be a local. No one's coming from outside. So, you know, the word is going around. Anonymous letters start again. And so, when you are in a mode of, you know, suspicion, um, who do you suspect? Like, you just think, the gossip goes around. It's this odd family in the village. It's this brown man with his white English wife and these three odd-looking half-caste children, and um, they've done it. <laughs> you know, that's the thing. So, of course, you have the useless police. They can't do anything. And as it moves on, one, one day, six months later, horse is killed half a mile from the vicarage, Police move in, arrest George Adalji, take him, take him to the police station. And of course, he is charged with uh, this heinous crime. He says he's never touched a horse in his life. He leads a really boring, mundane life. Uh, goes to his office, comes back, but he's caught. He's, the trial takes place, huge media. He's, uh, he's sentenced guilty and given seven years penal servitude. It's a harsh sentence, uh, but of course, he goes to prison. A campaign still takes place that he couldn't have done this. You know, this, this was a miscarriage of justice. This goes on. A petition starts, started by his father from the church, and people sign it. 10,000 sign this. And then suddenly, the Home Office releases him. He's out on parole three years later but he's been struck off solicitor's roles, he doesn't have a job, he doesn't know what to do. So what does our young George do? He picks up the pen and he writes to Arthur Conan Doyle, the most famous writer of the time, and he says, 
Only you can help me clear my name. So that's, that's the first bit of the story. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for you know, uh, this amazing stage setting, because now comes Arthur Conan Doyle, who is practically the sleuth here, the detective here. Uh, Arthur Conan Doyle, uh, the creator of Sherlock Holmes, <laughs> of course. And he's going to get to play uh, Sherlock Holmes here. He's, he's going to, uh, you know, uh, do his investigation about the case. But first of all, Shabani, I want to ask you about what was Arthur Conan Doyle, what was ACD uh, doing that time? What was his life situation like? And when George wrote to him, uh, how might he have reacted? What might have piqued his interest? Mm -hmm. Why did ACD uh, get interested? Because in contemporary terms, I'm trying to think of, so I was thinking yesterday about, uh, you know, uh, who is it like now uh, among crime writers globally that I can say mm -hmm. that this is the ACD figure of our times and I couldn't actually come with one. <laughs> so, so he was really, really big, right? That's like a big, big, big personality. So what might have piqued his interest and what were his first sort of inter you know, uh, interactions with George or, or with the case itself? Yeah, that's really interesting. So when this letter drops through uh, Arthur Conan Doyle's door, he is actually, I mean, many of you, I'm sure all of you have read uh, the Sherlock Holmes books, and many of them begin with Holmes in this sort of moody, uh, you know, he's a bit depressed, he's playing the violin, or he's taking some, you know, he's taking a shot of something, and um, actually that is, minus the drugs, that is the state ACD is when he receives this letter. Because he's in a state of, uh, he's, he's in a dark space, he's lost his wife, uh, she's died of tuberculosis six months ago, and he is um, feeling terrible about her death, naturally, but he's also feeling very guilty because he's fallen in love while he was looking after her. He's fallen in love with a young, with a young woman, a very feisty, charming young woman, and he's now free to marry her. So suddenly he's feeling guilty. Did I wish my wife was dead so I could marry this? You know, he's in a dark space, and suddenly this letter comes through. And it's like, help me. And it's a case of, he can see this is a case of miscarriage of justice. And he just jumps to the cause. He says, you know, something to champion, something to fight. And he writes in his own memoirs that it was a welcome distraction, the George Adalji case was. So it was helping him as well as George. Well, he takes up the case and he's such a professional. So the first thing he does is he's got to meet George, calls him to the Grand Hotel in Charing Cross, and um, he reaches a little late, but George is there early. He's sitting in the lobby, and he's reading a newspaper. And he's holding this paper really close to his face. And um, he looks up, and Arthur Conan Doyle, just like Sherlock Holmes does, you know, art of deduction, and then he concludes things without even speaking to the person. He actually stops by the door, and he looks at him. And his deduction is that this guy, he had, George is innocent. And why does he think that? Because he's seen him holding the paper, and he says, a person with such, such, uh, such a lot of myopia, you know, he's clearly really myopic, could not have crossed the fields, dark fields at night, and slashed cattle. So instantly, he deduces um, George is innocent. And then he goes up to him and says, are you astigmatic? And he says, yes. He said, did it come up in the court case, in the trial? George says, no. Yeah. And so that's where he starts. He then goes to the scene of crime. He's going to do everything that the police should have done and that Sherlock Holmes would have done. He goes, he interviews the locals, interviews the police, goes to the pub, has a drink with the locals, examines the soil. And then he writes this article in the Daily Telegraph and it's called The Case of George Edalji, splashed over eight columns, and he completely demolishes the whole police case and calls out a miscarriage of justice and says it's bias, it's inefficiency, and he puts it out there. And George is famous after that. Yeah, that <laughs> sounds wonderful, right? If, uh, miscarriages of justice today could be helped by writers writing <laughs> articles. I think it would be a better yes. place. <laughs> uh, my, my next question actually is about your process of writing the book. I think Julian Barnes, the fiction writer, uh, he wrote a novel called Arthur and George mm -hmm. about the friendship or the relationship between 
ACD and George Idalji. And that book did really well. I think it was shortlisted for the Booker. Mm -hmm. And around that time, I think you mentioned it in the introduction as well, that you were thinking, maybe it's been dealt with in fiction. Maybe I, I should not go deeper into the George Adalji case. But then something changes. Mm -hmm. so, so my question is about what changed and what piqued right. your interest again. Yeah. Right. You know, so as historians, we always have a list, at least I do, of lots of people I want to follow up. And then um, I, George was always on that list. And then, of course, Julian Barnes does a spoiler. <laughs> you know, where's Julian Barnes and me? I'm a nobody. And so he does this fictional account. And then I said, OK, that's done. And I put it away. But then in 2015, something happened. And that was a small article in the Times. Uh, and it said that some papers were coming up for auction. And these were letters between Arthur Conan Doyle and the police chief who was heading the investigation. And for me, that was a sign. I said, come on, you've got to get new material. Also, I do nonfiction. So, you know, I get into the police files. I get into the archives. And I said, there's got to be new material. So I followed the trail of those boxes. They made their way to the Portsmouth. They were bought. So first I had to pray. For God's sake, don't let a private collector get these boxes, and then I'll never see them again. <laughs> uh, so I went to Bonhams, actually, the auction house. It's quite a funny story. I'll say it very quickly. I went there uh, wearing my journalist hat, and I said, yeah, I want to see these papers. So all these boxes were put in front of me. And I was like, oh my god, I'm going to die. There's so much material here. And I was writing and writing. And finally, the Bonhams guys came and said, you know, I obviously, for a press article, you don't need more than a 1,000 words. And I was there two hours. They said, you've been here two hours, madam. <laughs> like, what do you do? <laughs> you know, uh, this, is not a res this is not an archive. And then, you know, in a very firm and polite British way, I was warned twice, and then I was asked, you know, sort of firmly led out of the, of the auction room. Anyway, uh, and then I prayed. I said, oh, God, let it not go to a private collector. And it didn't. It went to the Portsmouth Library. So within weeks, I was there. I could follow it up. And then, of course, it's not just one source of archives. That was, those were the police boxes which were you know, absolutely new material on this whole case. Because there's a police side of the story. And there in front of me, I could see the blatant racism and a whole lot of other trails that you know, I had not expected, that even Arthur Conan Doyle would not have known on, of that was happening behind the scenes. So it was, it was entirely, very, I won't give away too much, but it was fascinating. And what came up was that the police chief, when Arthur Conan Doyle got into this investigation, um, because he had been shown up as inefficient, he had to prove himself, and he was really cross. He wasn't going to be taught policing by a writer of crime fiction. So, you know, his ego is hurt. And then he starts laying false trails to trip up uh, Conan Doyle so that he is discredited in the home office. So it's a lot of police corruption and a whole lot of things that happened, all of which actually he was so unaware of. Both George and ACD didn't know till they died, I mean, that all this had happened. But it's in the police file, so I could then reconstruct the whole story and put it together. <laughs> yeah. uh, so tell us a bit about George's life after he, after he was cleared, uh, mm -hmm. you know. And I also want to talk about what did this case and ACD's involvement in it mm -hmm. lead to? Uh, you know, what sort of changes happened in the judicial system or in the uh, criminal justice system? Yeah, so actually it's really interesting because the thing is everyone had, this was such an important case in its day. Um, you can imagine George, uh, the, these articles written by Conan Doyle were reproduced around the world. So they are in Washington Times, in the New York Times, in Washington Post, around UK. And suddenly this George Italji, this very quiet, awkward, um, solicitor, is, his face is plastered across the world. Even Nehru, who was a young, um, uh, he was an 18-year-old student uh, at the time, uh, studying in Harrow, he writes to his father and he says, the case of George Idalji is being widely covered and I think he was charged just because he's an Indian. So, you know, everyone's involved. Uh, and, um, but, you know, years down the line, this very famous case, People had forgotten about George. Nobody really knows him anymore. So it was, it was quite sad that um, Arthur Conan Doyle compares it with this case called the Dreyfus Affair, which happened in Paris, which is um, uh, so uh, basically somebody, uh, a Jewish man, who he was charged with selling military secrets. 
and he was arrested. And it was a case, it was found to be, that it was completely uh, false. It had been sold by a Frenchman, and it was just prejudice that made them do this. So he says, this case is like the Dreyfus affair in France. Uh, that happened to a Jew. This is happening to a Parsi. And all uh, Arthur Conan Doyle's, all his contemporaries, Bram Stoker, George Bernard Shaw, they were all saying, you know, well done, because you're fighting this miscarriage of justice. And he wrote, I mean, so Emile Zola, the French writer, had written uh, Jacques, a very famous article on the Dreyfus affair, saying, I, you know, I accuse. And Arthur Conan Doyle wanted to be uh, the Emile Zola of Britain. You know, he wanted to take up the Adalji case. But while the Dreyfus affair is so famous, it's had books and films and everything, uh, poor Idalji, you know, <laughs> nobody really knows about him. I mean, they do now, but they didn't really. Uh, and um, I, I just felt bad because this man actually changed the law in Britain. Apart from everything that happened, um, 1907, it led to a change in British law because the Court of Criminal Appeal was started. So previous to that, if you were charge guilty, you had no recourse. You could not go to a higher court. All you could do was petition the home office. And that's what they were doing. All of them were just petitioning. But then the law changed. So it should have been called George's Law because it happened because of him uh, that they actually started the Court of Criminal Appeal. Um, so that's his contribution in his own way. So one short question from my side, and then we can open it for a couple of questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is, we do, I'll not speak about India, but we, we do hear about institutional biases and outright hostility at times mm -hmm. uh, in the police forces and judiciary. Of course. So I thought that the story was very relevant and it needed to be told. Mm -hmm. And was that partly the drive that you had behind writing this book? Well, actually, as I was researching it, obviously, you, you, know, you see the parallels. But what happened is um, the last bit of the editing happened in 1920. Uh, uh, 2020, and that was the uh, you know the lockdown and the um, well, the whole pandemic and the lockdown, and uh, Black Lives Matter. Within a few months, it, that exploded all over all over the world, well, Britain, America, and you realize that you know this is still going on. Unconscious bias, racism, and so many reports that come out just saying the same thing. Who were the people who were rounded up and arrested most during the lockdown? It is entirely blacks and Asians. Who fills the jails the most? Blacks and Asians. So it's, you know, there is, there've been so many reports as to why this happens. Um, there is institutional racism in the judiciary, in the police service. And sometimes if it's not institutional racism, it's called, um, what's the word they use now? Very fashionable. Um, bias? Unconscious bias. Unconscious bias, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a new buzzword. Yeah, so that's, um, that's what is happening. So, you know, nothing's changed. This, all this happened over 100 years ago. So we have time for one question. I okay. One or two. Okay, yeah, we can go there or here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hi, uh, it's a lovely book. Thank you. So I wanted to ask you one question, you know. It's clearly a case of heartbreaking injustice, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. When you write a story like this, because... It shocked me a bit, you know, and I had to take a bit of time off and then come back and read it. Mm -hmm. As a writer, how do you get over? How did you get over that shock to be able to tell this story, mm -hmm. you know? And secondly, just a little thing, you know. So such kind of stories sometimes uh, can frighten people of, you know, taking risks mm -hmm. because these are the things your, you know, elders, or we as elders tell you, don't do this. This won't work. It's too dangerous. Don't go there, don't marry out of your caste or whatever it is, don't go to a new place. You know, such stories can really, really frighten people of <laughs> taking, uh, you know, those kind of risks. So how did you factor that in, you know? Um, so. Well, actually, yeah, like you said, you know, when I'm looking at these, so the archives in London, in the National Archives in Kew, they have many of the home office files, and they have these anonymous letters that were sent to the family. And I have the images in my book. You can see them. It's, it's heartbreaking when you see, you know, what it's like saying, we, your son will be killed. This is a 12-year-old boy. You know, what would, how frightened would his father have been? So it's, it's things like that. But, you know, you've got to do the story. So and you just put on a hard, hard hat and just carry on. <laughs> yeah, one last quick question. One, yeah. one last question from B. The book is, the book is 
book is amazing, Trudy. Oh, it's just, thank you. It's such a word of, of <laughs> detective prowess. Oh, thank I you. Mean, you've beaten Arthur Conan Doyle at his own game. And the treatment of George Eldadji, Eldadji is so distressing at times and so um, protracted. Did, did you... Did you become distressed in, in the research, because the research is so in-depth and so detailed, you spent so much time amongst that. What were the bit sparks of sunshine for you, if any? Yeah, they were actually, because A, of course, I felt really bad for George Adalji, but at the same time, I said, wow, hats off to him. This guy didn't go down quietly. He wrote to Arthur Conan Doyle. <laughs> he made the biggest you know, face in literature stand up for him and fight for him. And also, there were people who supported him. So. In everything, I, I do look for the good side because I'm, I'm just an optimist. So there were 10,000 people who actually signed this petition. They were all white. So it's not that everyone was racist. Of course, this little village was. Uh, but, uh, you know, you look at the bright side of things. And hats off to his courage. He, he fought on. He kept campaigning. So, yeah, good for him. It was, I think, true sort of immigrant spirit that he showed. And, yeah, <laughs> he did it. <laughs> yep. I think...